All right, starting over again here. This should be working. Um, yeah, so uh, here I'm talking about the Unitarians and the Transcendentalists, also sometimes called the New England Transcendentalists, in terms of their role and influence here in terms of the rise and development of the new spirituality that's very popular today. Now, where we ended last class or last video was talking about theosophy and that developed out of spiritualism and they contributed some very important ideas that become quite popular in spirituality today. Well, now we're going to look at uh, some other groups and movements that also developed earlier on, though, in the 1800s in America that became very influential for various reasons. Now, the Unitarians and Universalists, they began as individual Christian denominations in the late 1700s in both England and America. And then coming over to America, they got, became quite well established in the early 1800s and then eventually merged together in the 1900s because they had so much in common. There was hardly any difference between them. And so they have their roots, as you can see here, in the biblical tradition, in, in, in the Christian tradition, okay? And they basically represent, represent very much a liberal version and understanding of Christianity, all right? Being very much influenced by the Enlightenment, okay, of the 1700s. And of course, I um, pushed the wrong button. There we go. So what happened is that you know, we had the rise of, uh, you know, the Enlightenment. I think I mentioned that way back in the beginning in the 1700s, where we had uh, more and more intellectuals uh, rejecting the authority of religion, i.e. the authority of the church, in its claim to truth, and pushing increasingly the idea that it is reason and science that will bring us to truth, not faith, belief in a holy book that's believed to be a divine revelation. Okay, you know, we've talked about that. And, uh, and so we get, um, as a result of this, it starts to influence Christianity, where various theologians and Christian leaders start to incorporate a more rationalistic approach to the Bible and to the Christian faith, where they started to look at the Bible no longer as an inspired, revealed holy book, but as an historical document that was composed in the distant past that did not actually contain historical facts, but was believed to contain mostly myths and legends and outdated superstitious beliefs of the ancient people. And so they dismissed anything supernatural, anything, you know, that would be, we would call spiritual or religious in nature, but that, uh, that these were just creations of the human mind uh, out of uh, uh, infantile beliefs that uh, believe that gods created the universe and gods make the sunshine and the rain to come and, and everything is caused by spiritual forces that now science is disproving and, and, and revealing and showing that everything has a natural explanation. So there's no need uh, for anything supernatural. Okay, so the supernatural, anything spiritual gets increasingly dismissed as being a superstitious thinking of primitive people who just didn't know, didn't have the science to understand how things actually worked, right? This is sort of the trend that happens, okay? And so this obviously starts impacting the church and Christianity. And as I was saying, more and more uh, theologians, leaders become more rationalistic in their approach to the Christian faith. And so they start interpreting it differently, no longer believing in any of the supernatural teachings or elements in the Bible, uh, that no miracles could possibly ever happen, that people just made up these stories of any kind of miracles, uh, that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, well, of course, that couldn't happen, but that sort of thing just doesn't happen in this world. Uh, Jesus going around healing people. Well, of course, that's impossible because, hey, you know, who's doing that? We don't see that happening in the world. You know, so all these sorts of supernatural elements get dismissed and they're written off as just being stories that people have created in the past, okay? So, so that then will challenge a lot of the fundamental or very core classical traditional beliefs in Christianity get challenged here. And, um, and so with that, we'll find new churches emerging that are liberal in teaching and they will no longer believe uh let me just see here where am i here um i think i might move to the next slide 
because here, what starts to happen, William Channing being one of the leaders here amongst the Unitarians, you know, what they basically started to believe and promote is they rejected any kind of literal interpretation of the Bible. You can't believe it literally and understand it literally, interpret it literally, because a lot of these stories are just make-believe stories. And, uh, and so you cannot, of course, really believe it. Right? So that's sort of what's meant by rejecting biblical literalism. You cannot take it for truth. And so they emphasize human reason. And then consequently, the impact in terms of doctrines is they rejected the concept, the teachings in Christianity of God as a trinity, the concept of the trinity in Christianity, that God exists as God the Father, God the Son, i.e. Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that God, uh, can, God is a unique being who is one being that consists of three persons who coexist as one being. So there's one divine essence, one divine reality, but that divine reality or essence is expressed through three distinct personas uh, that are in relationship to each other. And so that there is inherent within the Godhead, a sense of plurality of personhood, all right? And, and again, I don't want to go off on this, do this in Christianity, uh, but that is the basis of the idea that God is love, because how can you have love without relationship? How can there be love if there's no lover and beloved, one who receives and one who gives the love? Uh, love is meaningless unless it is in the context of relation and relationship, personhood, and plurality of some kind, right? And so, but this has been a key teaching in Christianity is the doctrine of the Trinity, and that entailed that Jesus was not a mere human being, but was the Son of God, God incarnate, uh, the deity of Christ. So that gets all rejected here. That's why they became known as Unitarians, because they rejected the Trinity. They were no longer Trinitarians. Uh, they just were Unitarians. Uh, they only held that, yeah, we can relate to God as Father, end of story. Not Jesus as the Son of God or the Holy Spirit, it's just God as Father. And so with that, they also held that the essence of God is God is good, God is loving. He is not a judge. So there's not really going to be a judgment day. There's not really going to be a hell that some people will go to on a judgment day. So they reject some of those classic teachings. And they emphasize that all human beings are inherently good. And therefore, they rejected any idea that there is something sinful within human nature, that people are capable of evil, okay? And this is where the universalists, they get their name, because the universalists, they first began their teaching with the idea that everybody gets saved and there is no hell. Uh, and so universalism refers to the idea of universally everybody is getting saved everybody is going to heaven and doesn't matter what <laughs> okay that's where the word universalists come from and eventually then these two they're going to join up and merge because they basically were holding to the same beliefs just the one started on that all salvation is universal everybody gets saved the other one by rejecting the trinity but then otherwise they all agreed on all these points Okay. And so, yeah, so salvation is something that is automatically there. There's no, actually, in one sense, no need for salvation. We don't, because we're not getting, we don't have to be saved because we're not, nobody's destined or going to hell. So there's no need for salvation as such. So Jesus is simply an example of how to be the ideal moral person. Okay. That's going to be the classic thing in liberal theology is Jesus is just an example of the highest level of morality, of what it means to be a good person, the ideal person, right? That's what he's all about. Not that, you know, he brought about salvation. Anyway, you know, we do this in Christianity, so I don't want to go into it too much. Okay, I already do too much. Uh, and so this is how they saw that Christianity is all about really morality, uh, just kind of following the rules of being a good person. Jesus is a good example, and you don't take the Bible too seriously or too literally, and all that kind of stuff. And so what ends up happening is you have this liberalism developing, but what also happens at the same time in the late 1700s and the early 1800s, beginning in England and then continuing on and developing in a big way in America, is revivalism, okay, revivalism, where people would gather 
in large groups and hear an evangelical preacher, they're gonna become known as evangelicals, that are going to uh, focus instead of this rationalistic interpretation of Christianity to an experiential emphasis of Christianity. That you need to have the born again experience, that you need to really have this powerful internal experience of literally experiencing yourself being saved by Christ. That Jesus becomes very real to you on an experiential level. People would have visions of Jesus, experience the love of God directly and powerfully. People would experience healings and, and their lives would be radically transformed, all right? And they'd have these conversion experience. This is where we get the conversion word really starting to appear of that it's not enough to maybe have been raised in the West, in Europe as a Christian, maybe gone to church and la di da all that sort of stuff. It's like, that doesn't mean you really have had the experience of Jesus as the risen Lord who saves you and can change your life from the inside out and brings to you eternal life here and now. A powerful experience of being born again. And this is what these, this revivalist movement was huge. They, they couldn't build churches fast enough or big enough to contain it. And so they'd have to do it outdoors under these huge tents with thousands of people gathered. Right. And and so this is called the, the, the Great Awakening. All right. Uh, the Great Awakening in, in terms of history and, and the Christian tradition. Uh, again, it begins in England in the late 1700s, largely with uh, uh, John Wesley and the Methodist movement. And then it spreads into America and becomes known as the Great Awakening. And there are three main waves of this awakening that happens. And so. That then gave rise to a movement that becomes known as evangelicalism, okay, the evangelicals or evangelicalism, where there are Christians who are more in the conservative, not liberal camp, who emphasize that you have to have this born again experience. Okay, and so they are out trying to bring this conversion experience to people to convert you. That's what it means to evangelize is to convert. And so this is a big movement that goes on. Okay, so anyway, just for context, you've, you've got all this going on. So we find then here more and more of a division happening in Christianity between the conservatives and believers versus the more rationalistic liberal bend of churches. Uh, they start going along different pathways. Okay, now let me just go back up to the previous. Now, how do I get it? I can never get this. Bit. Whoops, where was I? So where am I here? Yeah, okay. So anyway, so there you go. So, so Channing was a, a key figure here. And uh, yeah, I don't really need to go back, but it comes out of Christianity and you get this kind of um, uh, split happening. So, oh yeah, here, this is where it's at. So the rise of this revivalism and evangelicalism, you know, in these waves, as I was talking about this great awakening in various waves, three big waves that happened during this time, uh, fueled the split between more liberal and conservative Christianity. Okay, and then in the liberal camp of Christianity, there were those that formed specific denominations that became known as the Unitarians and Universalists and rejecting the Trinity and being inclusivists, meaning that everybody gets saved. And so the result though, the key thing is that the result from this in terms of the Unitarian Universalist trend is that they started to lead the way in the study of other religions. Right. This is, we take this for granted today, but at this time period, I realized this was not happening. Okay, um, uh, because they were open to the idea and 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 promoted the idea that everybody gets saved, and that really Christianity is not somehow the way of salvation, and that you have to become a Christian to get saved. And they now dismiss that, and they say, "No, no, no! Everybody gets saved." They start promoting the idea and 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 exploring the idea that there is truth in all religions, that all religions in some way uh, reflect truths about God, about spiritual realities, and that all religions can be embraced, that there is some validity, truth, wisdom, uh, benefit in all religious traditions. Okay, 
So they really opened the door to this. And some of the first people to study other religions came out of the Unitarians. Right. They kind of led the way of bringing this into the, the first universities, you know, like Harvard and Yale, uh, opening the door along these lines. So this then, in turn, uh, ended up encouraging spiritual exploration outside of Christianity and to advocate for the spiritual value of all religions. Mm, this is a key thing. And very quickly throughout the 1800s, the Unitarian uh, slash universalist church became dominant the dominant church denomination on the eastern seaboard okay that really got a stronghold there and the more conservative christians ended up going more still to the state it's more like midwest okay midwest usa all right okay what they often call the bible belt all right okay so yes yeah, so now i already went through this <clears throat> So we have this all going on here in the early 1800s, okay? Well, the next key figure here is Ralph Waldo Emerson, and you've got his dates there in the 1800s. He became uh, the most famed and influential intellectual at that time in America in the mid 1800s, along with David Thoreau. They, you know, uh, have some publications that they put up. And, uh, and what they basically started is a whole new type of spiritual orientation, a type of nature mysticism, if you like. Emerson was a Unitarian, but he broke away from the Unitarians for being overly rationalistic in their approach to Christianity, okay, and to religion in general. And, and, and he kind of reacted against it just being this head trip, a thing in your head, you know, about following certain morals and being a good person. And, you know, and that's what it's all about. He held that, no, there's something profoundly spiritual that's meant to happen, something inward. All right. And he held that you need to get more in touch with your soul and inner intuition. And you would do that through some self-reflection, self-awareness. Uh, journaling techniques, you know, writing uh, your thoughts and reflections in your journal and spending time connecting with your own soul, going inward, right? Exploring your soul, exploring your inner life. And that also being in nature, that God, the, the divine would speak and can speak and does speak through nature, is present in and around us in nature herself, right? And then also when you come together in a circle with like-minded people, people who also are willing to go inward to tune into their soul and commune with nature, and you come together in a circle to connect with each other, it's almost like something more magical will happen. There'll be a sense of spiritual awakening, spiritual growth, a kind of a spiritual attunement that will happen through doing these sorts of things. Okay, that all of this is a way of coming to know God, so to speak, tuning in to the divine that is present within me, within you, within life. All right. And so these were to become their spiritual rituals, daily rituals, weekly rituals. This is how it all began. They started to meet on a weekly basis, a little circle of them. And they became known as the transcendentalists. Uh, they formed like almost a little bit of a club where they would gather on a weekly basis for doing this sort of thing, sharing their reflections, doing this kind of inward attunement type of thing. And then they also uh, put forth a, a publication, a journal that they started to publish called The Dial. And that's where a lot of Emerson's material showed up and thorough. And he also wrote a book, uh, Walden Pond. And and that just, again, just reflecting this whole kind of spiritual approach. And along with this, Emerson was quite interested in Hinduism, uh, was key in inviting a certain Hindu teacher to come to America for the first time, and had a vision, which he was never able to get to because he died, you know, you know, uh, before it happened, uh, his dream was to create a type of world Bible that would encompass the wisdom from all traditions, okay? And as I say here, he held that nature is an embodiment of the divine. It's like nature is, is sort of the body and God is the soul of life, the soul of nature. It's a divine world soul. 
Uh, and so the teachings of the transcendental, it's just a little side note, influenced John Muir, who established the Yosemite National Park, because John Muir, in being influenced by the transcendentalist, and, and just seeing that nature is the presence of the divine manifest to us, it can speak to us. Uh, this was a time when they were cutting down all the old growth forests, major industrialization going on in America, uh, and that he put in place that, that, that the government should uh, create national parks to protect nature, right, to protect wilderness. And so he was a key figure in that. And also the Sierra Club uh, also was sort of influenced by these ideas of promoting the value, the spiritual value of nature. Okay. Oh, hang on here. I'm missing. Okay, okay, the result. I'll come back to the result in a bit here. Let me go through these beliefs here. So here is, you know, again, uh, just a, a quote from, uh, there's a picture of well, I'm sure that's a picture of Emerson, not David Thoreau. They look so much alike. Anyway, who knows? Maybe somebody screwed that up. But uh, yeah, here you go. There's some quotes here. Uh, Emerson, so a thought you reap an action, so an act you reap a habit, so a habit you reap a character, so a character and you reap a destiny. Right? The life you, yeah, live the life you have imagined. So they emphasize the role of imagination, uh, intuition. All these things that have become very popular today in terms of the spirituality, right? And so here, as you can see, the basic beliefs, everything in the world, including people, is a reflection of God or of the divine soul, right? God is here in me, in you, in all of life. This is where God is here and now. So we're kind of seeing almost a reversal. You know how I mentioned, you know, uh, earlier that the religions tend to focus on God as transcendent, up and above and separate. You have God-focused centered religions. Then you have nature-focused religions that the divine, the spiritual is in nature. And then you have others that emphasize the divine, the spiritual is in the self. And that's like Gnosticism, right? And so here you see uh, an emphasis that the divine is both in the self and nature and not transcendent, right? So the physical world is a doorway to the spiritual. That's how you connect to the spiritual is by going within your soul, within the self and tuning into nature. People can use intuition. It's through intuition that you can then see and experience the divine in nature and in your own soul, right? And it is a person, and this is where we see a major shift. You yourself are your own best authority, not the church out there or the government or a society out there. That authority comes from within by connecting to your own true self, okay? Your higher self, the divine self within is your ultimate authority. And lastly, feeling and intuition are superior ways of knowing to just reason and the intellect. So you can see here, this is a reaction to the enlightenment that's going on. And this is where uh, they were in very much influenced by the romantic movement, romanticism, which was also kind of a reaction against the rationalism of the enlightenment. Okay, and this is how it's showing up in terms of religion and spirituality. Um, no, I thought there was one more thing. Oh, here. So basically, the transcendentalists here represent a, a very much an American form of nature type mysticism and an emphasis on what today we would call personal growth, self-development, right? It really has its roots going back to this. It's a spirituality that's grounded in nature and the self, that the world, the universe out there is an embodiment of the divine spirit, divine soul. Now we've kind of already seen this type of idea, right? In theosophy, we're talking about, you know, we are God having the human experience and all of the universe is a manifestation of the divine, right? But here in this wing, they don't do the theosophical thing about the different levels of vibrational frequency and all that kind of talk. It's like, that's just not really showing up here. Okay. Um, and so anyways, it's held that when you commune to nature uh, and really connect, nature will speak the mysteries of the divine to you, will reveal the teachings and wisdom of the divine. It will be brought to you through nature. It's a bit of what Paracelsus said way back when. And actually, you'll find this teaching even in the history of the church, right? Uh, I think it was Bonaventure. And I think he's the one, St. Bonaventure, who kind of emphasized this. And you'll, you, you know, you'll have Francis of Assisi and others. Um, you know, it's, it's there in, in the Christian tradition all over the place, too. Um, the divine is also within, found through inner reflection, inner connection to one's very soul, intuition, right? Already said all this. And so their religious rituals 
Okay, and this is again how it's different from traditional religion with its rituals of going to a service, sitting down in a chair, somebody reading from a book, singing some hymns or songs or what have you, you know, in the highly ritualized kind of process in a group gathering, here's very different. The rituals are one of communing in a circle with like-minded ones, where you together are on a journey of self-reflection, working with intuition, right? Do maybe some journaling techniques, talking, sharing, communing, meditating together, right? Uh, and, and doing this kind of connection. That that is sort of what replaces it, right? This is sort of what replaces uh, traditional ritualistic activity for them and nurtures their sense of spirituality. And so, whoops. So the result here, it is the rationalism from the, that came from the enlightenment of the Unitarians. What it did is it served to discredit traditional Christian teachings that supported uh, traditional Christian teachings through their supporting liberal universalist theology, which in turn opened the door to other religions and spiritual explorations. And this is what we see, we'll be seeing happening big time. Beginning in the late 1800s onward, uh, there's going to be the World Parliament of Religions that will happen in 1893 uh, that the Theosophists were very much a part of, uh, the Transcendentalists, many of these esoteric kind of groups are very supportive of alternative spirituality, opening the door to other religions. And that is what begins in the late 1800s and continues through. It kind of got frozen during the wars, World War I and II and that, and then it really kicks off in the 60s. Okay, it really kicks off the 1960s with the counterculture. Okay, but this is the turning point of opening the door here. Uh, that is something that didn't happen in China. You know, India was always somewhat pluralistic, but not like this in, in, in India, not like this in the Middle East. This is very much America. Okay, it really opens up here in the West like that. And that's going to be key to the rise of the new spirituality is this kind of universalism and eclecticism, right? And then, and furthermore, the transcendentalists, what they then bring into this liberalism is a rejection of its rationalism, okay? So yes, these liberal universalist ideas of open to other religions, but they rejected the rationalism of it and instead emphasized intuition and a journey of going inward to the self and also connecting in with nature, all right, for a direct experiential connection with God. Right, as opposed to the study of a holy book and following dogma. Uh, these practices, you know, these practices were largely drawn from the Christian tradition. I mean, that's where they got some of these practices from, okay, uh, that emphasizes inner spiritual practice uh, because very devout, very serious, very committed Christians would do these sorts of things. But they applied that spiritual practice now to a more universalist kind of theology, okay, a type of Gnostic nature mysticism. And this is what becomes very central to, quote, American spirituality, right? It becomes very highly popular, okay? So this is a key role of the transcendentalists, their major contribution in the story of uh, the rise of the new spirituality, okay? All right, I will end that for here, for now.